So in my first lecture, I uh, concentrated on defining the quantum circuit model and went through a number of examples of other things you can simulate using the quantum circuit model. So this was kind of an argument in favor of the idea that this model captures all of what we should regard as quantum computation. And then we went through some building blocks for algorithms, which were gate universality, by which we could um, decompose arbitrary unitaries into quantum gates. So if the unitaries were acting on only at most logarithmically many qubits, then we could do this in polynomial time. And for arbitrary unitaries on n qubits, most unitaries can't be made efficiently. And then we went through some of the building blocks. So uh, controlled unitaries, which is sort of the quantum if statement, reversible computing by which we can uh, embed classical computing inside of quantum computing, the phase kickback algorithm by which we can <coughs> institute uh, any efficiently computable phase onto our wave function, and our phase estimation algorithm. <coughs> so in lecture two, we introduced some more building blocks. So we had oracles, which are kind of quantum subroutines, the Hadamard test, which will be very uh, important today. So this allows you to estimate matrix elements of unitaries that you can make by quantum circuits. And then the Hadamard and Fourier transforms, which uh, I won't really need today. And we used these to look at some quantum algorithms. So what will we do today? So today, I'm going to look at a different class of quantum algorithms. And these are for estimating topological invariants, such as invariants of knots and invariants of three manifolds. And so <coughs> aside from algorithms, we'll also go through some arguments why we should believe that these problems are hard in the first place. And uh, as we'll see, this is kind of an important thing to do because average instances of these problems at the level of approximation that quantum computers can do are actually easy, and in fact, trivial. But there do exist very hard instances, which are as hard as anything that a quantum computer can do. So what's the, the, so the first I'll go through the case of not invariance. This is maybe the easier case to understand. And historically, it was the first case uh, amongst the things I'll talk about today that was um, understood in the context of quantum algorithms and complexity. So a uh, knot is an embedding of the circle into three-dimensional space. So unlike knots on your shoelaces, uh, these ones are loops. They don't have any ends. And so you can look up uh, knot tables. And mathematicians have uh, um, categorized all the knots with no crossings. There's only one, which is called the unknot. That's just the circle. And then all the knots with three crossings, and so on and so on. So here, here are the first few in, from one of those tables. And so we don't care about the details of how we draw these things. The knots are considered equivalent if you can smoothly deform one into the other without cutting it, without cutting and gluing or passing uh, um, strands through each other. So these knots are all inequivalent to each other. And that's what they mean in knot tables. But then here's a, an example. These two knots are equivalent. So these loops could just be untwisted without having to cut the strand. And these ones are inequivalent. There's no way of uh, deforming this smoothly into that one. So you notice here, I'm using this notation where we draw a break in the line. That's just a schematic way of representing the idea that this strand passes under that one. Yes? Um, there's no known way to do that. And uh, yes, so the strongest upper bound on the complexity of this problem is that it's contained in NP intersect co NP. So the unknot, well, so that's the unknot problem. If for the general equivalence problem, I think maybe even less is known. But uh, so it's unlikely that the unknot problem is um, NP complete. But there's no known polynomial time classical or quantum algorithm for it. <coughs> yes, the unknot problem is given a knot, decide whether it's just equivalent to the loop. Can you completely untangle it? So that's just a nice yes or no decision problem uh, of the sort that complexity theorists really like. Yeah. Uh, 
So the containment in CoNP is actually a pretty re recent result uh, by Greg Cooperberg. And it's not completely unconditional. He assumes the generalized Riemann hypothesis. <laughs> I don't know how the proof works at all. Uh, OK. So <clears throat> now, just to introduce a little more terminology, we're really going to look at the more general setting throughout this talk. Instead of just talking about knots, we'll talk about links. So that's just, instead of one loop, you can have any finite number of loops. So here's the unlink of two strands. Here's something called the Hopf link. Here's a, a famous one called the Borromean rings. And I guess people find it interesting because if you snip one of these rings, the whole thing comes apart. Uh, so knots are a special case of links where the number of uh, strands is one. OK, so the big problem in knots is the knot equivalent prob equivalence problem. And so we're given two knots, and we want to decide whether one can be deformed into another. I won't define that formally, but I think hopefully you can see uh, what I mean. And so, of course, to make this into a legitimate computer science problem, you need to um, specify the um, inputs in some kind of digital way with finitely many bits. In principle, a knot is some continuous object which would take infinitely many bits to specify. But if you just care about equivalence, you don't need to specify the details. So one way to input knots into a computer is with a diagram like this. So you can think of this as just being a, uh, a graph where all the vertices have degree 4. You can see there's four lines coming out of each vertex. And each vertex is just labeled in one of two ways, either as an overcrossing or an undercrossing. So it's pretty easy to see that uh, in that case, you can input this digitally onto a computer. You put the adjacency matrix of a graph and then one bit of information for each vertex. So it turns out that not only can the inputs to the problem be specified in a discrete way, you can actually um, convert the whole problem of knot equivalence into a discrete math problem. And that's through something called the Reitemeister moves. And so that what the theorem says is that uh, diagrams of equivalent knots, or actually diagrams of equivalent links also, <coughs> are always reachable by some sequence, which might be long in some cases, composed from these three moves. So the move one is you just have a loop and you pull it tight. Move two is you just have two things uh, passing over and you pull them apart. And move three is. You have a crossing and then, a, and then the, another strand going across, and you just move this down to the other side of the crossing. So it's pretty easy to see that each of these local moves are indeed invariances of knots. And the non-obvious part is that these actually, and in fact maybe sort of amazing part, is that these three moves are sufficient to generate all equivalences of knots. So uh, <coughs> then you have the unknot problem, which in principle is now completely discrete. So you could say, oh, I want to find some sequence of Reitemeister moves to do the disentangling. But first of all, that sequence of moves could be very long. And even if it's only polynomially long, it can, could take you exponentially much time to find it if you had no better ideas than brute search. So what do we know about the complexity of this problem, as I've alluded to? Deciding equivalence to the unknot is contained in NP and also in co-NP. But we don't have any um, polynomial time classical or quantum algorithm for this. So uh, no one's been able to find an efficient algorithm. So maybe sort of a next best thing is to be able to compute something called knot invariance. So what a knot invariant is, is it's a function which takes as its input a knot, produces something else as an output, maybe a number, maybe a polynomial, maybe a group, but just some elements of a set which hopefully are easier to tell apart than knots are. And what makes this function an invariant of knots is that if A and B are equivalent knots, then F of A equals F of B. Now you'll notice that this definition does not require 
that if A and B are inequivalent knots, then F of A necessarily is unequal to F of B. So for example, the trivial function that always outputs zero is technically a knot invariant, it's just a very useless one. So some are stronger than others. And if you have one that is completely strong, that always does distinguish every knot from every other one, then that's called a complete invariant. But very few of those are known. So one invariant of uh, oriented links, uh, which include oriented knots as a special case, is the Jones polynomial. So this is just kind of a technicality that for the Jones polynomial, you want to assign a direction to each strand. So it's just a slightly different setting. So uh, what happens is you uh, take some knot, you can do some procedure, and you compute a polynomial in a single variable, which we'll call t. And the coefficients are all integers. And equivalent knots always lead to identical polynomials. And the Jones polynomial is not known to be complete for knots, and it's in fact known to not be complete for links. But it is a pretty powerful invariant. It does distinguish most pairs of inequivalent knots that you can come up with. And it's uh, stronger than most of the previous invariants that were known from the early 20th century. This is a kind of a breakthrough in, in the, uh, the 80s. Yes. So these coefficients can be computed. Uh, in fact, in the problem set, I gave a little description of how to do this and an example that you can work through. Um, but it does turn out that these coefficients are, in some cases, very laborious to compute. So what is, in general, the case is that if you count the number of crossings in your knot diagram, the amount of effort that it takes you to compute the coefficients scales exponentially with that, because these coefficients are exponentially large, and you're kind of like counting up a bunch of different cases. Yes? Right, so, um, so the, the main thing you want to be able to do is efficiently solve these problems. So, yeah, so I believe one complete invariant is called the knot group. So this is the um, uh, fundamental group of the knot complement. And, but then if you want to, so then it's a map to, to groups given by presentations. And um, deciding equivalence of those is just another hard problem. So that doesn't necessarily help you so much. So efficiency is really. Yes, that's right, yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. Yes. That's, uh, to summarize the rest of my talk in one sentence, that's it. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I've mentioned that um, the Jones polynomial is known to not be a complete um, link invariant. And there's a very funny paper, which is, which is the one that uh, proves this. And it's just like two pages long. And uh, here are the two links, which are inequivalent to each other, and which both have the same Jones polynomial. So kind of an amusing little paper, I thought. So I thought I'd show you that. OK. So uh, I think it was by computer search. Um, I'm not sure exactly how he knew that he showed that those knots were inequivalent. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, OK. So uh, as I've mentioned, the coefficients in the Jones polynomial can be exponentially large and hard to compute. So the degree of the Jones polynomial is not large. There are only um, 
polynomially many coefficients you need to write down. So you can always write down the Jones polynomial in a reasonable amount of space, but actually computing it is hard. And in fact, it's known that exact computation of the Jones polynomial is sharp p-hard. So one thing you might be thinking right now is that we've made a step in the wrong direction if our goal is to decide equivalence of knots, because that was a problem contained in NP intersect Cohen P. Now we've converted it into a sharp p-hard problem, which is much worse. And doesn't always do it either. And doesn't always work either. <coughs> um, and so, well, I have, the two things I have to say about that are, one, Sometimes uh, approximating Jones polynomials gives you interesting information about the knots. And two, Jones polynomials have uh, intrinsic interest unto themselves, I would say, especially due to their connection to physics. So what is the connection to physics? So in 85, Von Jones discovered the Jones polynomial. So this was, I think, the first new discovery of a uh, knot invariant in, uh, I mean, most of the previous uh, not polynomial was the Alexander polynomial, which was something from like 1930 or so. And so this was uh, a very exciting new breakthrough. He wasn't, I guess, really looking for invariance. He was looking for, uh, uh, he was working on algebra problems. So he won the Fields Medal uh, for that. And in 1989, uh, Witten showed that the Jones polynomial arises as an amplitude in Chern Simons theory. And this was really a, a considered a very beautiful um, connection between uh, physics and, and pure mathematics. I guess the story behind this is that Michael Atiyah somehow figured out that this is probably true, but he couldn't figure out how to prove it. And he, every time he saw Ed Witten at a conference, he kept like pushing at him to try to convince him to prove it, and he eventually did. Um, so <laughs> given these facts, one thing that I've uh, emphasized in all, all three lectures was the church turing deutsch thesis. So as soon as you hear that some object from uh, pure mathematics arises in physics somehow, a little voice should go off in your head from church turing and deutsch telling you, oh, maybe you can find an efficient quantum algorithm for approximating this quantity. And so, uh, Friedman, Kataev, Larson, and Wang heeded this uh, little voice and uh, found a quantum algorithm for approximating Jones polynomials and also proved a BQP hardness result. So I'll, I'll um, delve into that a little bit more. And some other early important work on this was by Dorita Heronov, uh, Von Jones, and Zeph Landau, where they extended uh, this algorithm to be uniform in in k, where you're looking at kth roots of unity as your val val variable in the, um, in the polynomial. So <coughs> what is uh, the connection to physics? I will describe it in a slightly different uh, terms than um, what Witten originally used. And the way I like to think of it is that it basically, um, you can think of the connection in terms of anions. So if you think of particles confined to uh, a two-dimensional plane, the winding number of the particles is well-defined. Unlike the case in three dimensions, if you take one particle, you wind another one around it, well, how do you know really how many times it went around? You could go in some complicated path, and it's not a well-defined concept. Those loops are contractible. But in the plane, you can say, well, this particle wound once around here or it wound twice around, and correspondingly, particle exchange can induce phases, which depends on that well-defined uh, winding number. So instead of fermions and bosons, which correspond to plus one or minus one under exchange, you can have any phase under exchange. And in fact, not only can you have phases, but you can have unitary transformations that depend on this winding. So uh, if there's here's. Um, some graph I, I threw on the slide from a paper. I should, probably should have given, uh, written where this came from. Um, but this is uh, something called the fractional quantum Hall effect. And I just put it up there to emphasize that there are actual experimental systems where people think that 
uh, anions really exist as quasi-particle excitations, and in fact, that even that non-abelian anions might exist. So what the point is, is that you have some system with a degenerate ground space, and when you wind the particles around each other, it induces a unitary transformation within that degenerate space. So what that means is that these uh, anions give us a unitary representation of the braid group. So if you start with some particles, you wind them around in some sequence of moves, uh, the space-time diagram of the trajectories of those particles forms something that's called a braid. And then corresponding to that braid, there will be some unitary transformation within this degenerate ground space. And this uh, obeys the the very natural composition processes. If, uh, if you uh, do one braid and then you do another, correspondingly what happens is you have one unitary and the following unitary. So that means that this is a homomorphism from the braid group to the unitary group of the appropriate dimension. So what it turns out is that in some cases uh, the set of unitary transformations induced by elementary crossings is a universal set of quantum gates. So these little crossings can act essentially as gates and do arbitrary quantum computations. And this is the idea behind topological quantum computation, which will be talked about um, later this week. Yes. So I've kind of changed the uh, perspective. Here, the braids are going up, kind of in the physics convention of time flowing upwards. And this one's on top. Well, I guess I can't really see. I guess the black one is going over the red one. And here I've changed conventions where uh, time is going sideways. And which one is passing over the other is indicated by breaks in the line. So I'll write them sideways throughout the rest of these slides just to make the correspondence with quantum circuits more direct. No, this is actually just a random braid. The braid that you would need to represent a circuit like this by any of the known constructions would probably have like 500 crossings or something. The, the kit. So the, the it would be approximate also, that's true. So um, the, uh, the conversions that are known uh, are efficient in the sense of having polynomial overhead, but um, the constant factors, as, as complexity theorists would say, oh, it's just a constant factor, but it, it can be pretty big sometimes. Yeah. Yes. So one thing that's necessary is that, well, OK. So this is, um, I'll, I'll put it this way. In practice, in every case that we know where we get a universal uh, computation from braiding, the underlying fact that enables this is that you have a dense representation of the braid group into the unitary group. So uh, um, I do have some slides on, on kind of giving a little idea about what a dense representation is. So I'll, I'll just wait till we get there. But yeah, these are good questions, and, and please ask more. OK, so I've kind of alluded to the braid group. And what do I mean by that? So first of all, I'm being a little sloppy by saying the braid group, because there is an infinite family of braid groups depending on how many strands you have. <coughs> so the, here I've drawn elements of the braid group on four strands, which is um, denoted B with a subscript 4. And an element of this will be something where you have four pegs on the left, four pegs on the right, and four strands that sort of move monotonically from left to right while winding around each other. So something where the strand goes backwards is not considered a braid. That's a, a, a more general kind of object. And then, uh, so how does it form a group? Well, there's a notion of multiplication of braids, which is just concatenating them together. So you just glue each of these pegs to each of these pegs, 
And in this case, if you did that, you would get this braid, as you can see. And so you can work through the axioms of a group. Uh, for example, besides uh, composition, you need each element to have an inverse. You can see that that's the case. If you just compose this with the crossing going the other way, that's the inverse. Uh, and so these things form a group under this, this composition notion of multiplication. So <clears throat> what else do we know about this group? Well, we can just generate it by the crossings of neighbors. I think that's fairly intuitive. So we say, here's the three generators of the four-strand braid group, sigma 1, which is the crossing of the first two, sigma 2, and sigma 3, which is the crossing of the last two. And of course, we also need their inverses. So there's a, a remarkable fact from the early 20th century uh, by Emil Artin, which says <coughs> not only is the braid group generated by this discrete set of generators, but we also have a complete discrete categorization uh, of the relations amongst these generators that correspond to topological equivalence of braids. And those are these relations right here. So it's an analogous situation to the Reitemeister moves. We have sort of a discrete set of equivalences, in this case a list of only two of them, uh, or two types of them, I guess you could say, that generate all of the equivalences. So let me draw some pictures of, of what these things mean. So here's the first relation. I'm just copying it from the previous page. And this says sigma i sigma j equals sigma j. Sigma i of i minus j is greater than or equal to 2. So all that's really saying is that crossings on disjoint sets of strands commute with each other. So here we could apply this one first, apply this one second, or the other way around. These are clearly the same braid. And if we had some representation into unitary, say we had a direct mapping from crossings to gates, then two qubit gates would automatically satisfy the same relation. So it's a, a fairly uh, familiar kind of thing. So the second uh, relation is sometimes referred to as the Yang-Baxter equation which also arises in statistical mechanics. And that's a slightly less obvious one, but it's, it's kind of, it's basically the same thing as the third Reitemeister move. So if you write out this expression as a diagram, you can see that what's going on here is you have this crossing, and then you have this strand going across. Now you've just sort of taken this strand and moved it down here, but it's still on top. So these are equivalent braids also. And if you add a mapping from uh, braids to two qubit gates, it wouldn't necessarily s satisfy this relation. This would be a, a non-trivial constraint on gates that looks like this. So I've taken a long detour into braids, but my, remember that my original motivation was knots and links. So what's a way, what is it? Yes. Yes, so in the, in the Jones polynomial case, you don't have a mapping like this directly between crossings and gates. Uh, in, say, in a quantum double model, you can, you can have something like this. But those don't give you quite as powerful link invariance. What is a quantum double model? Um, so in that case, you have two different kinds of uh, particles, which are called charges and fluxes. And so, I can write down, so a flux, it behaves like this. So you think of the, uh, think of this as a 2QDIT gate. And think of the states of the QDIT uh, being the formal span of the elements of some finite group, G. So here you have some group element A and some group element B as inputs. Then as outputs, take B on the top, and on the bottom will be 
B inverse A B. So this is uh, so this is what you represent an elementary crossing by. And so if you do the arithmetic here, you'll find that this map always obeys this Yang-Baxter relation right here, assuming I've written, remembered it correctly. I might have gotten the A and the B reversed here. I think I got it right. Now, you notice that this map is just a permutation matrix. You're just taking basis states to basis states. There's also another kind of particles called fluxes, which induce phases. I don't remember the formula for that one off the top of my head, but once you include both of those things, you can get fairly rich fully quantum behavior. So, uh, but it's true. So in the Jones polynomial case, which I'll mainly focus on, you don't have quite such a direct mapping between crossings and circuits. Um, so now let's start to move back towards our original problem, which was distinguishing links. So what's the connection between braids and links? Well, let's say what's a connection between braids and links, and here's one. So you can actually uh, make links out of braids. So if you start with a braid, if it's on an even number of strands, you can always cap off the ends in pairs with these little caps. That's called taking the Platt closure. And another thing you can do is, for an even or odd number of strands, you can just take the strands from one end and loop them around and join them to the corresponding strands on the other end, and that's called the trace closure. So there's a, a famous theorem, Alexander's theorem, which says that any link can be obtained as the trace closure of some braid. Might not. Uh, yeah, so that's what the theorem says. And actually, there's a corollary to this, which says that any link can be obtained as the Platt closure of some braid. And in fact, it's not so um, hard to show this. So if you stare at these diagrams, maybe you can see how to convert uh, a trace closure into a Platt closure. Does anyone see it? Uh, is there a question? Uh, oh, so, so the part here in red is, is the original braid. And then you just take a little bit more string and you add it to these ends to connect them to each other. So now this thing is just one continuous loop. So now it's a knot. Uh, Oh, so as particles, um, so now I'm just talking about s from a strictly mathematical point of view. Um, so this doesn't have exactly a direct connection to particles. Um, this more or less um, in, some, uh, in some sense corresponds to a space-time diagram where you did pair creations from the vacuum, braided things around each other, and then did annihilations at the end. So that's at least a physical intuition about what this might relate to. But as at the level I'm talking now, it's just a mathematical operation that you can do. It's a good question. Yeah, you can't you can only do this one at, for an even number of strands. That's right. All right, so uh, I'll show you the answer to this exercise. So if you start with some trace closure, you can just bring these return strands upwards so that they go back right next to the strand that they started from. So now we've brought each of these things back into our braid. And now this is twice as many strands. And we're taking the Platt closure. So do you see it? Right. Yeah. So it's the same link, but it's now the Platt closure of a different braid. That's key. Oh, sorry. Maybe I didn't specify well enough the problem. Made it harder than it is. Okay. <laughs> 
But anyway, now we've seen the answer, so it's it, it's it's zero hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. So maybe I didn't present that quite right. All right. So now, um, returning to a common theme of this talk, we like to convert topological problems into discrete problems. And we can do that in this case, too. So <clears throat> what Markov's theorem says is if you have some function on braids, this will be an invariant of the corresponding trace closures of these braids. Recall that's this thing right here. So that's a link. It's this invariant under the two Markov moves. So if you can find some function on braids that has these invariances, that gives you a link invariant immediately. So what are the two moves? Move one is here I'm thinking of A as some arbitrary braid, B as some other arbitrary braid. Now we reverse their order. Oh, yeah. This should be, this should be B and A. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a very helpful move. Yeah. And you can see why the first Markov move is true, because if you had braid A here, braid B here, you bring this around, and now it's right side up again, and it's on the other side. So that's an invariance that's easy to see. Um, the other move is you add one more strand and one extra crossing. Here, this is a, an arbitrary braid. So why is that one true? So we start with our arbitrary braid. This was the trace closure before, and these things go around too, but I didn't draw them. Now our new braid looks like this. So if you look at this, this thing is just a little loop-de-loop. -loop. You can just untwist it and, so, and then pull it tight, and this just becomes that. So that's just a matter of sort of staring at it. Yeah? Do you want these moves to be true for parts of the braid, or just if you take the whole braid and cut it in half, like say for the, the first move? Oh, yeah. So this thing is for the whole braid, unlike the case of the Reitemeister moves, which are applied to pieces. Yeah, that's all you need. So. OK, so we've seen that these two moves are both true. That's not hard to see, that these are both invariants. And the non-obvious part, again, is that these generate all the equivalences. So um, what the Markov moves suggest, I think, is uh, they suggest a strategy for what might be a promising approach for finding invariants of links. And that would be to take the trace of a representation of the braid group. And so why is that? So to be more precise, we have not the braid group, but b sub n for each different n, how many strands we have. And we correspondingly have a representation of each one. This might, for example, be a homomorphism from b sub n to the unitary group u d sub n, some dimension. And so since it's a homomorphism, that well, all that means is uh, row of AB equals row of A times row of B. That's what a representation is. So then if you take the trace of that, in other words, the character of this representation, that's automatically invariant under the first of these two Markov moves. And you can just prove that in, in three lines. If you have trace of row AB by the homomorphism problem, that's trace of row of A times row of B. And by the cyclic property of trace, that's trace of row of B times row of A. And then using the homomorphic property in reverse, that's tro trace of row of VA. So that's exactly the first Markov move. If we change the order of two uh, arbitrary braids, then what, this. Uh, the, oh, yeah, the first Markov move is, is this one, except this should say B and this should say A. These are the two Markov moves, yes. So then, uh, quote unquote, all you need to do is also ensure that this function, that this uh, representation is chosen such that you also have invariance under the second Markov move. Uh, and of course, that's a little glib because it's not so easy to find such representations. But at least this gives you some intuition why taking traces of representations might be a promising approach for getting link invariance. 
So in particular, one way of viewing the Jones polynomial, which is somewhat different from the way it was originally viewed, is that you have some certain representation of the braid group, or of all the braid groups, which I'll call the Jones representation. I guess some people call it the Jones-Wenzel representation. And which, when you take the trace, gives you back a, uh, um, a link invariant. I mean, uh, I guess I should say that's not quite true. There's a technical point. You take two different traces and you do uh, a weighted linear combination of them. But basically, basically that's what, how it works. <coughs> so the Jones polynomial, the Jones representation is something that when you write it down, it has a, a somewhat quantum computing-like character to it. It looks similarly defined to, to quantum computation in that it's a unitary representation defined in terms of local rules. So here I'm writing as an example for a specific case that the uh, Jones representation we're taking uh, at this variable t equals the fifth root of unity. In that case, the way to compute the representation is we write down these ones and zeros in the gaps between the strands. And then each time we have a crossing, we can think of that as like a local gate that <coughs> is acting on the three uh, values, the ones and zeros around it, which maps it to some linear combination of uh, either what you started with and what you started with with the thing in the middle flipped to a one. Now this is somewhat, as you've mentioned, it's, there's a difference between qubits in the sense that here uh, it's not quite as local in the sense that you can never have two zeros next to each other, unlike qubits where you can have arbitrarily, uh, arbitrary bit strings. But it's, it's basically similar in flavor. So these C and D coefficients I haven't write, written down, but you know, one, one could write them down if, if there's just some formulas. Oh, well, this is, what's that? No, so um, that may coincidentally be true about what I drew. But um, so this is just saying we have, uh, and so instead of having all two to the n of these, we have all the ones that don't have zeros in a row. So it turns out the number of those is the nth Fibonacci number. And so these form a basis of some space, just like the two to the n bit strings form a basis for a space of a quantum computer. And then these rules specify how this braid acts on that space. So we're not actually picking individual <laughs> strings. We're just saying we want to know how this thing acts on the space, the formal span of all these strings. And that's our unitary. <coughs> yes. So you can just, let's say, apply this one first. Now we have a linear combination of two different uh, bit strings. Then we apply this one. Then maybe we have a more complicated linear combination of four. And we apply them one by one until we've applied all of them, just like quantum gates. And so you can see this would be hard to compute because the number of terms in this linear combination or superposition, if you think of it quantum mechanically, um, just explodes exponentially. No, so this sequence I just picked at random as an example. And why can you not, can you not have two zeros above these three? Um, well, that ultimately comes from uh, the, the underlying, uh, the way I think of it is as coming from the underlying physical model. And it's sort of analogous to the fact that like two um, spin one half particles can't add up to being, you know, a, a spin one half. Um, it's probably not a good idea to go all the way down that road, but we'll just we'll just say that this is this sort of is the definition of the Jones polynomial. It turns out to be, first of all, give you a representation of the braid group, and secondly, um, the trace of that representation is invariant under the second Markov move, and therefore gives you um, a link invariant. Yes. 
oh, C and D are determined by T. So like, uh, <coughs> perhaps for concreteness I should have written it down, but it's C is just like, you know, minus T to the fourth or something, or I don't know, I don't exactly remember, but they're just, uh, they're, they're determined by what value of the variable you put into um, the, the Jones polynomial. Right, so for fifth roots of unity is when we have uh, ones and zeros. For other roots of unity, it's, there's the same thing, except that now instead of ones and zeros, we'd have more values uh, allowed for our, our dits over here. Yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah, no. that's true, yeah, no yep. So, so we understand the rules. Suppose in the one on the right, on the left-hand side of the <coughs> equation, suppose it started at 0, 1, 1, what would be the two vectors on the right-hand side? In that case, you would only have 0, 1, 1 on the right-hand side, and the, the coefficient would just be a phase. Okay. So, uh, all right, yeah, so this example's for the fifth root of unity. More generally, you'd have a bigger list of labels to write down. Um, and where, where do you get that t from? How do you know that this needs to be i to pi over pi? Oh, you just choose that. So, um, you could, so the original Jones polynomial formulation, t is just a formal variable. You don't even have to think of it as being a number, it's just t, you know. And here we're plugging in actual complex numbers for t. So what happens is we're doing something, in a, is if we work through this procedure with a specific value of t, we're doing something weaker than what you would get by just writing down the whole Jones polynomial as a formal polynomial. At the end of this process, you get this unitary matrix, you take the trace, what you're going to get is some complex number, which is the Jones polynomial evaluated at a specific value of t. So that's clear that that is still a link invariant, but now it's weaker than writing down the full polynomial because you're sort of you have this link invariant, and now you're uh, composing it with something else that's non-injective. Yeah. Um, well, I guess you could probably think of it as a, so if you didn't want to fill in a specific value of t, I guess you could think of this representation in terms of a homomorphism from the braid group into matrices whose entries are each polynomials. I, I think that's valid. Um, so it's a set of matrices with the, with, with the element being polynomial uh -huh. labeled by T. Yeah. So it's a set of uh, homomorphisms that could be labeled by T. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's right. Okay. So uh, <coughs> what is our quantum algorithm for estimating the Jones polynomial? Basically, we are just implementing this Jones representation, which is some unitary transformation acting on these formal strings of symbols, by invoking our gate universality. We know that for any uh, unitary of polynomial dimension, or in other words, acting on at most logarithmically many qubits, we can always make that, we can always at least approximate that as well as we want using our standard quantum gate set. That's from the first lecture. So now if we have something like a, a little low dimensional unitary representing the individual crossings like that, we can decompose each of those into gates, concatenate all these little gate sequences that implement the crossings one by one, and we correspondingly have a quantum circuit for this, this representation rho of, of our braid B. And so, uh, as I've 
mention and just kind of to have certain points to, to hammer on repetitively. Because the Jones polynomial has this connection to physics, then this is not totally uh, just some random quirk. It's, it, you should sort of expect this because we expect quantum computers to be able to simulate physical processes such as with anions and so forth. So now, but what do we actually do with this circuit that we made? Well, we can just use our, again, another thing that I like to repeat a lot, the Hadamard test. We know how to estimate any diagonal matrix element or, uh, of a quantum circuit using the Hadamard test and even non-diagonals if you can construct the corresponding states. So just to recall how that works, we create our superposition state. We do a conditional evaluation of this quantum circuit, which is implementing the unitary that represents this braid. We have some state here, which, we could, which could just be a bit string. And we do this Hadamard measurement. And we get some probability of outcome 0, which is proportional to the real part of this uh, um, matrix element. So by sampling this a number of times, we can estimate what this um, matrix element is. So now, if we just choose a random bit string each time, then what we're doing is we're just averaging over all these different diagonal matrix ele elements. We sample from that. That allows us to estimate the trace, which of course is just the sum of the diagonal matrix elements. So that's the essence of how you can evaluate this trace. And similarly, you put in a different value here, and you get the imaginary parts. So between the two, you get everything. Now, <coughs> uh, that's the essence of the algorithm. And the next question to ask is, is this interesting? Is this non-trivial? So what you can see is, because of the sampling errors, you, know, you run this. Uh, um, process n times, you're going to know this uh, normalized trace to within plus or minus 1 over root n just by usual sampling <coughs> behavior. So this is what we get. So what we're getting is uh, an additive approximation to the Jones polynomial. A lot of times in computer science, what you would really like is a multiplicative approximation. So you have some epsilon, and you can say, here's this quantity Q that I want to estimate, and I'm guaranteed, or at least with high probability, that the answer I get from my computation is no greater than Q times 1 plus epsilon and no less than Q times 1 minus epsilon. This is not what we get here. We get just Q to within plus or minus epsilon, independent of the value of Q. So if this thing is very small, then the multiplicative approximation is going to be something much better than the additive approximation. And that's an important fact. So this also came up in, in Scott Aronson's talk about the, the permanent. The multiplicative versus additive approximations there is a very important distinction too. Now, if you think that if you just kind of use uh, some uh, very loose heuristics, you might say, well, if B is a random braid, then rho might look sort of like a random unitary. And what's the trace of a random unitary? That's going to go like the square root. The magnitude of that is going to go like the square root of the dimension of the unitary. Because you have all these things down the diagonal, and they're all pointing in different ways, these different phases. And so it's like a little random walk. And how far you get only goes like the square root of how many steps you take. <coughs> So if you ch and in fact, this, uh, this sort of heuristic argument gives you a correct conclusion, uh, which is that if you, uh, if you pick random braids, this normalized trace is going to be very small. And remember that these dimensions of the uh, representations are exponentially large. So square root of an exponential divided by an exponential is exponentially small. And so if you estimate that within plus or minus epsilon, where you call epsilon is like 1 over the square root of the number of trials you've made, 
you're learning nothing, actually. So if for random braids and you run this algorithm, that's no better than just guessing zero every time. You just say, oh, every braid is zero. And that's an equally good algorithm for random instances. So this could make you very worried about this algorithm, like, oh, well, this is a completely pointless algorithm. But it turns out that's not actually true, because the hardest instances of this problem really are genuinely non-trivial, even at this level of approximation. And so how do we know that? Uh, so the, uh, there's two ways we know that. One is that we can prove that this uh, trace estimation problem is what's called DQC1 complete. So this is a complexity theory hardness result, which I'll explain shortly. And secondly, there's also another uh, algorithm that we can make, which is, which is better. So, I'll just, so that's my next, these two points are my next few slides. So when I say DQC1 complete, let's now forget about DQC1 and just focus on what do we mean by complete. So I think Scott mentioned this, but I, I'm just going to rehash it. Um, a little repetition doesn't hurt, I think. So I'll use the example of BQP, which is maybe at first more familiar than DQC1. So BQP is the set of problems that's solvable in polynomial time with a quantum computer. And a problem is called BQP hard if every problem in BQP can be reduced to it. So let's say you have, uh, mm, you know, s some arbitrary problem in BQP. You have your problem instance. You can do some polynomial time classical processing to convert this to an instance of some other problem. Uh, and that's called a reduction. So for example, uh, a trivial example of a BQP hard problem is evaluate a quantum circuit. That's pretty much BQP complete right from the definition of BQP. Uh, now, um, so you, ha you have a BQP, so here's BQP. And here at the top you have the BQP complete problems. And BQP complete just means it's BQP hard and it's contained in BQP. So you have a quantum algorithm and everything reduces to this. So everything else in here can be converted into one of these problems. And so in particular, if it were true that BQP complete problem, any of them is contained in P, that would mean all of BQP is contained in P because everything reduces into here. Does that mean that there's no point in building a quantum computer at that point? Your classical computer can do everything a quantum computer can do. Yes. So then everything is BQP complete. Oh, so here the reductions are done by a classical computer. Classical polynomial time computer is doing the reduction, converting the instance to another. Oh. Yeah. Okay, I see that. Yep. Yes, that's another way to phrase it, exactly. And so then the same terminology goes through. You can put any complexity class here in place of BQP, and it's the same idea. So NP complete, NP hard, those are terms we've seen already. All right, so what is the central tool that we're going to use to um, prove our completeness results? And the tool is density of a representation. So here I've drawn an example of that. No, that, uh, yeah, maybe I should have not built up the tension so much by giving you a gap before I tell you, but I, I will tell you. <coughs> okay. So uh, uh, here's an example of a dense representation. We have uh, a map from the integers to the unit complex numbers u1. So this, u, this is the unit complex numbers under multiplication. And our map is 
map the integer n to e to the i n. So it's pretty clear that this is a homomorphism if you do n plus m, that'll be e to the i n times e to the i m, which is equal to e to the i n plus m. So that's our representation. So if we have 0, that maps to 1. Here's the, uh, the complex plane. Then we map the next one. That'll be like you know, 1 radian, which is about a, a little bit less than a third of the way around. And then we add another one. And then we add another one. And this one, it's going to be just a little bit displaced from the first. And we'll never land on anything we've already been on because pi is irrational. So we just keep adding and adding, and pretty soon we've filled up the whole circle very densely. And that's the idea here. So at that point, say we want to approximate some particular element of u1, some particular phase, we can always find some integer n where rho of n will be as close as we want to that phase. So that's reasonably intuitive. And the part that's not as intuitive is that, in fact, you can find such an n uh, efficiently. And not only that, but you can do the same thing instead of with just u1, but with un for any constant dimension n. Can't do it for u1. Yeah. Oh, it does? Yeah. Thank you. OK. Oh, interesting. OK. So maybe it's a misleading example, but it at least. Uh, oh yeah, I should I should repeat what he said because it's kind of fun. So this actually doesn't work efficiently for U1. It only works efficiently if the uh, target group is non abelian. So yeah, I hadn't realized that. Sorry. That's right. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So I won't be reusing this example. I see. Okay, so you this number one here should instead it should say strictly greater than one. <coughs> okay, so um, the uh, Jones representation is unitary whenever our val variable t is a root of unity, which didn't show up for some reason, and we also have density. And not only do we have density overall in our whole exponentially large uh, um, unitary group, there's, there's local density in the sense that um, if you just have, uh, I can draw this, go back to this picture. If you have, say, some local region here, like maybe f four strands, these crossings generate, generate a dense uh, subgroup of all the unitaries acting on the span of those bit strings. Yes? Yes, so there are some exceptions. So the fourth root of unity doesn't work, and the sixth, and the one, two, and three. So it's five and then greater than six. So what this density allows you to do via the solovey kataev theorem is that you can make an approximate correspondence between quantum circuits and braids. If you have some individual gate, uh, you can then correspondingly construct a braid which approximates the unitary implemented by the gate. And unlike my previous examples, this is uh, a real example uh, in a certain uh, root of unity, I think the fifth. This actually does approximate this gate pretty closely. I think this example is from Leila Hormozy. I should probably write that here. Um, uh, so as you can see, it can take a pretty long braid to do a pretty simple gate, uh, but it's only um, polynomial overhead. So. <coughs> um, So far, 
<coughs> everything I've said has been in terms of the trace closure. See, maybe I'll do this in a different order. So, <coughs> so let me stick with the trace closure. I'll go back. <coughs> so I've used this term DQC1. Now I'll finally get around to defining it. So this is the DQC1 model. We have one qubit in a pure state. And then we have n qubits in the maximally mixed state. And then we're allowed to apply any polynomial size quantum circuit we want to that. And then we can do a measurement at the end on the first qubit. Um, so that's the complete uh, definition of the model. And so why was this introduced? Uh, so first of all, the class of problems that you can solve in polynomial time with this kind of computer is called DQC1. And the reason this model was introduced was because in the early days of quantum computation experiments, a lot of people were doing NMR experiments, liquid state. And in that case, you don't have the ability to initialize nice pure states. And so they were indeed applying basically unitary transformations on highly mixed states, high entropy states. And these states you could show had very little entanglement in them. So there was some debate as to whether these computers were really quantum at all. And so uh, some theorists, specifically uh, Ray Laflamme and Manny Knill, introduced a kind of mathematically clean, idealized, and rather extreme version of this where we say, well, let's suppose that we have maximal ent uh, entropy in all um, qubits except for one. And what they, were, what they argued was that even in that case, there were still some interesting and uh, quantum seeming things that you could do with this. And so their argument was that at least NMR computers were not obviously totally unquantum. <coughs> yeah? Are yes. So there's actually a little bit of ambiguity in how you define one clean qubit. Um, model, um, which is sort of a technical point. So if you say that generating this circuit and doing the post-processing on your output statistics is done by a standard polynomial resource classical computer, and you say that's your model, then DQC1 automatically includes P, just because you could ignore your apparatus and do the whole thing on your control computer. So sometimes it's uh, more uh, informative to define your control computer to be smaller, like for it to be a log space computer. Um, that gives you sort of a more fine-grained picture to compare P versus DQC1. So that's, yeah, that's an additional technical point that you can think about. So it's not, there's actually t two different definitions of this class that are sort of in circulation. And any time you write a paper, you have to say which one you mean. So assuming that you're not allowing a full P computer, just a log space computer, to do your control and post-processing, then what the picture probably looks like is like this, that DQC1 is something smaller than BQP. In, or, in other words, it's weaker than a full standard quantum computer. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily even contain all of P, everything that a classical computer can do. So, um, are you sure this is true it includes Shor's algorithm? Because I know there are these logs, there's this, um, uh, right, so there's this semi-classical Fourier transform thing from, uh, I forgot who wrote that paper. But I don't believe you can actually use this to put factoring into DQC1. So there is a paper on the archive that claims this, but I believe it has a mistake in it, actually. I, I don't actually think this is true. Oh. OK, yeah, I'd be interested. Um, OK, so I've argued, I've claimed that um, 
the uh, Jones polynomial problem for trace closures to polynomial additive precision is complete for DQC1. And so two questions, how do we, what's the essence of the proof and what does that actually tell us? So first, what does that tell us? What that tells us is, is that this problem, this Jones polynomial problem for trace closures is not contained in P unless all of DQC1 is contained in P. And there is some evidence that DQC1 extends beyond P, although the evidence is not as extensive, not even close to as extensive as uh, uh, the evidence that, say, BQP goes outside of P. But it would be at least somewhat surprising. And then uh, let's, so how do we know this is, uh, this problem is DQC1 complete? So here I'm just repeating one of my previous slides. We did uh, um, the Hadamard test and we sampled with random bit strings x here uh, in order to estimate the trace because now we're averaging all the diagonal matrix elements. So what does that mean, put random x there? That's the same as saying put maximally mixed state here. So that's how we know this problem is contained in DQC1. It's, it's very direct. And how do we know that it's complete for DQC1? Basically, because density allows us to take any quantum circuit and uh, efficiently convert it, density plus locality, really, is allowing us to take any quantum circuit, convert it into a uh, corresponding braid with still polynomially many str uh, strands and crossings as a function of the size of the original circuit, such that this unitary approximates the original unitary on an, an appropriate um, subspace. <coughs> and so basically, we can put in, we can reduce the problem of trace estimation of quantum circuits to a problem of Jones polynomials. And it's not completely obvious, but I think relatively plausible that trace estimation of, of quantum circuits is complete for DQC1. So that's the essence of, of this <coughs> argument. And another interesting uh, fact is that uh, these one clean qubit algorithms are pretty good for NMR quantum computers. And people have actually done this now, some estimated some Jones polynomials with actual experiments. Um, and so here are two papers about that. They, here's four qubits, and <coughs> these guys did two qubits. Now, these are all Jones polynomials that are easy to evaluate anyway, but it's nevertheless kind of neat that people have actually gone and done this. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, okay, so all the so this is going a little outside of of my knowledge base, but I'll make one comment which I think is um, at least relevant and correct. So the comment is and probably not an answer to your question, but the comment is I think the uh, connection to uh, Chern Simon's theory, the way it's usually phrased, is that the Jones polynomial arises as a Wilson loop in Chern Simon's theory. And so that's as much as I can do toward answering your question. Yeah. Um, well, no, it's not really that. So the, the braid corresponds to what sequence of pulses they apply in their NMR experiment. The choice of molecule is basically just telling you um, how many qubits you have, basically, and what couplings they have to each other, which then influences your choice of um, uh, pulses. So the problem with scaling is that if you wanted like 100 qubits or something, it'd be hard to find a molecule with like 100 nuclear spins that you can all access nicely and the entropy is high and, the, you know, there's lots of problems. Yeah. 
OK, so um, now that's the DQC1 story. And there's a parallel story, which I'll put back into a different order, uh, about BQP. So remember, we talked about two different kinds of closures for uh, braids to make them into links. One of those was the trace closure. The Jones polynomial of that was equal to the trace, well, modulo some details, which I'm fudging, is basically equal to the trace of a certain, the Jones representation of that braid. There's also the Platt closure. And what it is, the way, what happens is that the Jones polynomial of this knot is basically equal to a certain matrix element of this representation. And this is not really uh, necessarily a very good argument, but you can roughly think of these as sort of like pair creations and annihilations, which kind of gives you the idea that this is sort of like a vacuum vacuum matrix element. This is sort of a loose analogy. But the point is that just as estimating the trace, so we know that we can convert between quantum circuits and braids. So this problem basically using the Jones representation, so this problem basically corresponds to a matrix element of a quantum circuit. And it's quite um, it's reasonably obvious, I would say, that if the problem of estimating the all zeros to all zeros matrix element of an arbitrary quantum circuit is a BQP complete problem. First of all, it's contained in BQP. That, that's obvious. That's what quantum circuits do. It's complete for BQP. Well, the only thing you need to say about that is that if you wanted to ap work, uh, apply your circuit to some arbitrary input, you could instead just put um, act on the all zeros input and put not gates on every bit that should have been one at the beginning. So this is our BQP complete problem. And so now we have, for, the, for two of the basic quantum complexity classes, we have this sort of top logical pictorial way of thinking about them. If it's a one clean qubit, it looks like these sort of diagrams where you glue the ends together. And if you uh, have the B full quantum computing model BQP, it looks like gluing caps to the ends. And in fact, this picture about um, traces, cor traces of unitaries and correspondingly DQC1 cor mapping to gluing the ends together versus BQP corresponding to putting caps on the end is actually something that goes much deeper. And so I guess I have about uh, five to 10 minutes left. And I'll just give you a brief glimpse of this deeper picture of which um, this one is a special case. <clears throat> so one way to uh, uh, understand this deeper picture, rather than going straight to full generality, is just go to the next non-trivial example, which is three manifolds. So it's basically the same kind of thing as a not equivalence problem. It's another equivalence problem, but we're deciding equivalence of three-dimensional manifolds, topological spaces that locally look like just ordinary flat three-dimensional space. And so technically, our notion of equivalence here is homeomorphism, which is just a continuous map with a continuous inverse. So now we're talking about the spaces themselves, whereas with knots, we were comparing embeddings of things. So it's a little bit different, but the flavor is very much the same. And the fundamental question, again, is the same. We're trying to decide equivalence. So here is a classic example. We think of the coffee cup as being equivalent to the donut because they both have one hole in them. Now, we're not thinking of these as surfaces. We're thinking of these as being filled in uh, solidly. So this is three with, boundary. with boundary, yeah. So mostly I'll be talking about the case without boundary. Um, but I didn't have any pictures to put on the slide for that. So, um, so you might ask, how do we um, input a three manifold into a computer? I'll describe two ways which are each kind of instructive for different reasons. So one thing, it turns out to be a fact that uh, orientable three manifolds can always be made by what's called triangulations. 
Now the word triangulation is used in any number of dimensions. You only actually are using triangles in two. In three dimensions, you're using tetrahedra instead. So you just write down how many tetrahedra you want to start with, and then you just have this list of which face is glued to which face. So here's like a picture. I glued this face to this one, this one to this one, and so on. Now, this, since I glued every face to some other one, we have something without boundary. And you'll also notice that this picture intuitively makes no sense. I mean, how could you actually glue this face to this one and that one to that one? And you can't picture it. And the reason you can't picture it is because this particular three manifold, which I've drawn, which I, I think is a three sphere, is, is not embeddable in ordinary three dimensional space. But we don't require that. So that's one way you can specify. And you can see that's a completely nice digital thing. You're just giving lists of, of pairings, basically. Uh, so there's some moves that characterize equivalence, just like with knots. Uh, and you, one way to construct invariance is you associate a tensor with each tetrahedron. And then how you glue the tetrahedrons together tells you how to contract the tensors. And so, so what's the complexity of this problem? So top the not equivalent problem we know is contained in NP intersect colon P. Assuming the generalized Riemann hypothesis is true. For two manifolds, the equivalence problem is actually easy. We can do that in polynomial time. For three manifolds, we know that equivalence is computable. And for four manifolds in general, it's actually uncomputable. And we don't have any, we don't have any nice complexity upper bound on the three manifold equivalence problem that I know of, other than just that it's computable. Um, so uh, Again, so if these are hard problems, what we can do is, what can we do as a partial solution is to, is to try to compute invariance. So if manifolds are equivalent, they should have evaluate to the same thing. So I said the two manifold problems in P, that's just because for orientable two manifolds, uh, it's completely characterized by the genus, just how many holes the donut has. Okay, so now, I'll skip a little bit, and um, and come to the end. So the picture with three manifolds is very much like the picture uh, with braids. So just as you can start with a braid, construct a link by capping off the ends, you can start with something called a mapping cylinder and construct a three manifold by capping off the ends. So what a mapping cylinder is, is you just start with some surface, let's say the genus 2 surface in this example, and then you just take the Cartesian product of that with the unit interval 0 to 1. So you're just taking this surface and making it into a three-dimensional thing by smearing it uh, in through the next dimension. And then <laughs> these caps are what's called handle bodies. And uh, that's just you take, instead of the surface of a donut, it's the whole donut all the way through. So this is a three-dimensional object that has a surface. And what you can think of this handle body as is, or really any three-manifold, is a map from uh, one surface to another. So if it has only one surface, that's a map from one surface to nothing at all. And such a thing can be thought of as a vector because if you think of that, this imagine you had triangulated this. Then on the surface, you'd have the labels of the edges of the, of the faces of the tetrahedra that are still sticking out. And so then this thing is a map from linear combinations of those labels just to the complex numbers because you have nothing on the other side. And this thing has labels on both sides. So it's a tensor with indices on this side and indices on this side, which is like a matrix. So now if you cap these things together, you've got a closed manifold. You've eliminated all the indices and got a complex number, which is kind of a matrix element. And this is BQP complete if you uh, are choosing a particular manifold invariant called the Turaev Bureau. <coughs> 
Similarly, if you take the two ends and glue them to together, that's like taking the two indices of a matrix and contracting them together. So that's just taking the trace of the matrix. And that corresponds to the trace of a certain unitary, which can be thought of as corresponding to a quantum circuit. And for the tri Vero invariant, this is DQC1 complete. So this is uh, my last technical slide. And it's just to give you uh, an idea that there's kind of a deeper picture behind this, this fact that I described in detail. <coughs> this one I've kind of skimmed over very rapidly. But there's kind of a deeper principle coming from topological quantum field theory where if you have invariance of things that you get by gluing caps on the end, that's a lot like matrix elements. And if you have something where you glue the ends together, that's like taking traces. And this gives you an intuition about BQP completeness for this case and DQC1 completeness for this case. Uh, <clears throat> and certainly the containment part, uh, it's pretty clear that that should hold also in higher dimensions. The completeness is a little less, the hardness part is a little less clear. Okay, so I think I'm out of time. This will conclude my sequence of three lectures. I've covered kind of a hodgepodge of things that I found interesting, some of them which I felt were kind of the basic tools that were important for everyone to know who works on quantum algorithms, and some of them were just things that I thought would be particularly exciting to present. So I've presented only a very small piece of what already is known about quantum algorithms, and I hope that uh, it's also a small piece uh, of what remains to be undiscovered. So I especially like this quote from Newton about that, which you've probably seen. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I've really felt that you asked very good questions. And uh, these uh, slides, at least uh, an earlier version of them, is posted on the website. Um, and uh, also some problems. Uh, you can actually evaluate it, Jones Polynomial yourself, if you want to, to make things more concrete. And here are some uh, recent survey articles and uh, lecture notes that I especially recommend.